32 teams in 32 days. This is episode number 10, the Dallas Cowboys episode. Let's welcome in Jess Haney, staff writer for InsideTheStar.com. Jess, what's going on? Well, not much. Appreciate you having me on. No problem. Anytime. So it was another disappointing year for Dallas. Obviously, glim after the Dak Prescott injury. But let's start with, with the biggest news. Dak, Dak Prescott signed finally four years, $160 million. He got 40 a year, exactly what he wanted. Now, I've said forever that he's the most underappreciated quarterback in the league, constantly is winning, winning multiple division titles, playoff games. How excited were you for this to get done? Everyone was excited for it to just be done. Now, how excited you were about the amount of money he got, that that's a lot more opinion <laughs> about that. Um, I think that a lot of people don't appreciate just the way that this seems to always go is if you're the best available quarterback on the market in a given year, that's just how, how it goes. You're going to get paid a lot of money. It, it's happened so many times throughout the season, the years with Stafford, um, even Romo at one point when he got his deal. They're, none of them thought they were the best quarterback in the game when they got that money, but they got paid like it, and that's just the way the market works. So it was Dak's turn, and I'm I'm very happy to have him instead of what other options were out there. Yeah, because it, it, it's kind of that next man up mentality. I go back all the way a couple of years ago when Matt Stafford finally signed his extension. That, that, that to me kind of felt like the first of many, okay, next man up, because Stafford, I think, got 35 a year never won a playoff game only he had he had like one season with a winning record got paid all that money it's the the luxury or lack thereof of, of having a franchise quarterback and needing to pay him when it's his turn it's a, a situation that the Ravens are, are going to be in with Lamar Jackson the Browns are going to be in with Baker Mayfield because those teams are kind of built on having a rookie quarterback on a rookie deal or not a rookie quarterback, but having their franchise quarterback on a rookie deal so they can build so spend that money elsewhere on the roster for the Browns. It was their offensive line, the Ravens that they spend money on their running backs and their defensive line. So those two teams up there in the AFC North, they're kind of next to figure out, okay, how much money do we need to pay Lamar? How much money do we need to pay mm -hmm. Baker? Cause it's probably going to be a lot. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people point to the Seahawks and they say, well, look at what the Seahawks were able to accomplish with Russell Wilson when he was still on his rookie deal and look at where they're at now after he got paid. And that is a good warning example. I mean, it definitely is scary, but at the end of the day, what are you going to do? I, I mean, would you rather have one of the top 10 quarterbacks in the NFL or, or do you not want to? Um, because I can promise you most of the time odds are, if you have one of those top 10 guys, you're probably going to be a Super Bowl contender more years than not. And that's the goal. So yeah, exactly. And Dak Prescott is definitely able to put them in a spot to win as we saw what they were finally without him. And Dak kind of held all this leverage. And it's it's rare for a player in the NFL to hold this type of leverage. And he had it, got what he wanted, didn't get what he wanted last offseason. But, you know, he kind of wanted a, a five-year deal. But tagging him uh, last year makes this technically a five-year deal worth Mm -hmm. 175 something like that I believe the franchise tag was 30, 30 or 35 million last year so he he didn't get five but he got five years since you know he he, he asked for five years so it it was kind of a a win-win and for Dak he'll be he'll be probably on the free agent market I believe in four years or three or four years so it's so a, that was his goal yeah um, that was his goal I mean the players and the agents, they know what, what's going on. I mean, they see the way the NFL's money continues to increase. Um, even after all of this hype about, you know, lost revenue and the salary cap going down, look at this TV deal they just signed. Yeah. The money's going to be there. And it's kind of, it's, it's funny. We're almost seeing a shift toward more of an NBA mentality of, I want to become a free agent as many times as possible so I can just keep up in, I can keep getting market value for my services every single year. That's yeah. that's where these players are starting to go. So the Cowboys signed a franchise record eight uh, outside free agents this offseason. No one really that big, but they did sign a lot of guys, a lot of holes to fill. What are your overall thoughts on the, the kind of direction that they went during free agency? Um, I I think that I'm I'm among those who are a little frustrated that we don't see the Cowboys doing more in free agency um, anymore because, you know, I mean, I grew up with the Deion Sanders signing. I grew up with, you know, when the Cowboys would go out and they would get a Leroy Glover or they would get um, some of these guys who were just 
they walked in with Pro Bowls, they walked and they were still in their primes, as opposed to going and getting the Gerald McCoys and those guys when they're not Pro Bowlers anymore, but they've still got name value. I like the approach they took this year because I think that they they went in and they got a lot of guys who could help with something that's very important, which is um, getting Dan Quinn's vision for the team installed quickly as the new defensive coordinator. So they went and got both the safeties from Atlanta. Um, and um, now there's this, you know, there's the talk that they may be looking at KJ Wright from his days in Seattle to come in and help at linebacker. Um, I like, I really liked the Brent Urban signing for def for defensive line because run stopping has been our biggest issue uh, for the last few years now. So it seemed like they attacked their needs with good, solid signings. I appreciated that. But yeah, nothing flashy. Yeah. So a, a bunch of one year deals. Uh, I believe the only two multi year deals were uh, Jordan Lewis and cj goodwin so the rest were were one-year deals a lot of players are, are signing one-year deals because well it's a win-win for both the team and the player because not only does the player get to cash in the next year if, if he on a prove it year if, if he performs well team gets a comp pick just for signing that, that one-year deal and mm -hmm. um that was what people were talking about for kenny galladay and the Bengals. why would kenny galladay want to sign a one-year deal well if he didn't get 16 million dollars from the giants where no one was expecting him to that's he got exactly what he wanted turns out but if he if if that money wasn't being offered to him go to the Bengals, perform with joe burrow one year deal cash in the Bengals get a, a comp pick uh mm -hmm. in a couple of years so a couple couple of one year deals for dallas seeming as if they're they're trying to get guys who who fit dan quinn's scheme as you mentioned and see if they work if they do you can resign them if they don't they leave you get comp picks yeah, definitely. And, you know, the comp picks have really become the new reality of free agency. And it's something that I think a lot like the average fan may not fully appreciate the strategy that goes into comp picks. And I mean, just the Cowboys are a great example of that. Look at the benefit we're getting this year from the comp picks we got from um, Robert yeah. Quinn and um, Randall Cobb and some of those guys that we signed to one year deals in 2020 or 2019. I mean, so yeah, that's um, that's a big part of it. Is is it's a strategic move, and so you got you know one year of good work out of the Quins and the Cobbs, and now you're getting a nice day two, day three draft pick out of it too. I mean that's that's good business. And it, it's it's funny because in baseball you lose comp picks if you sign if you bring guys in. So it's 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 a completely different aspect. But um, so pick number ten, interesting spot. I've talked to people all over. They've told me with confidence, like with confidence. Oh yeah. They'll take Sewell if he's there Slater. If he's not they're they're locked in on a corner. They're going to be enamored with, with Micah Parsons. I'm not sure anybody knows what the heck they're going to do with this pick. Mm -hmm. Which direction can you see them going with, with uh, the number 10 overall selection? I mean, at number 10, they're in a position to take the best player available. And, and you still have that opportunity for, guys of exceptional talent to fall to you. So regardless of need, I mean, I am all in on the idea of Dallas taking Kyle Pitts. I know that there, you know, there's a lot of thought out there that this is the last thing they need is another offensive weapon. Um, but I actually just wrote an article on Inside the Star a couple of days ago about that. You know, they're, Michael Gallup's a free agent after this year. So yeah, they have this great three-headed monster at receiver, but one of those heads is probably gone after this year. So if you add a guy like Pitts, who is way better, a way better prospect at tight end than Blake Jarwin or Dalton Schultz or whoever they've got, he can learn as a rookie and still be an upgrade probably even right away. And then next year with three years left on his rookie deal, plus a fifth year option, he's your new three head, third head for your monster. And that's what you need. And that may be why it's a really good strategy, but the offensive lineman, I mean, Tyron Smith's getting older and, and is injured a lot now. Um, so if you get Pana a chance to draft a Panay Sewell or a Rashad Slater, I mean, these guys are perfectly legitimate picks. And then of course there is the need at cornerback. So if they certain or some of them, then they could go anywhere with it. It's a nice spot to be in. Yeah, sure. And <laughs> You, you mentioned Pitts. It's funny uh, because before the Niners traded up, a lot of people were, were interested to see if 
they would draft Kyle Pitts to just to make the world go crazy with a Pitts and Kittle. Also, a- Atlanta has now seems like 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 they're not the favorite, but but that's a direction that they could very easily go in at, at uh, number four to pair with Julio, Calvin Ridley, Russell mm-hmm. Gage, and just it's a, it's an interesting time in the NFL because so many teams, including the Dallas Cowboys, are like we're going to score thirty five a game and see if 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 you can beat us. And a lot of teams look like they're they're leaning towards that way yeah i mean the super bowl champion had the best defense in football the entire year but they also scored 25 26 points a game Mm -hmm. and offense is so key in the nfl and picking number 10 if arguably the best offensive player in the draft falls to you how can you not take him especially as you said with michael gallup probably out the door uh uh next offseason exactly and and i mean if you really think about it if you're, if you're concerned about helping the defense, what helps the defense more? One really good cornerback or making your offense so unstoppable, <laughs> you know, you can just light up the scoreboard, control the ball. I mean, time of possession and scoring more points are going to help your defense more than one corner, one cornerback. Yeah. So you mentioned the corners. Haven't really been able to replace Byron Jones. Now Chidobe Awuzie is out the door to Cincinnati. Trayvon Diggs showed flashes, but the cornerback position, probably your guys' big, biggest need, no? Absolutely. I mean, if yeah, if you were to go needs-based in the draft, then you would absolutely be taking Sertain, or you might even trade down and go after Farley or one of the other um, cornerbacks. Or you could you could take – actually, you could probably take Horn or Farley at 10 and be, feel perfectly good about that too. Um, even with the injury issue with Farley, um, I think he's still – an elite talent. Um, there aren't many players I would say that about coming out of Virginia Tech. I'm, I'm usually scared of <laughs> Virginia Tech players, but uh, they, they seem to do well with cornerbacks. Those guys have, have translated well to the NFL many times through the years. Um, so yeah, you could definitely look at cornerback. I do think that we, we it'll be interesting to see what Jordan Lewis, Anthony Brown, and some of these guys look like in a new defense with Dan Quinn because he has a way of making cornerbacks look really good. Um, sure. And so with, with other aspects. Um, so I, I don't know, it, it'll be interesting to see, but I, yeah, I, they're going to have a corner with either the first or the second pick in this draft, I would say. So 10 picks for Dallas this year, among the most in the league, like we mentioned, a couple of comp picks from Byron Jones, Robert Quinn, Randall Cobb, and Everson Griffin, six picks in the first four rounds. Do you see them using those extra picks to potentially stack up a certain position? If so, which, which position potentially? Um, well, cornerback, um, you know, I could see also, I don't know about stacking up. Um, defensive line is always, uh, or linebacker, honestly. I mean, linebacker is probably where we have the biggest depth issues. Um, I mean, Jalen Smith and Leighton Van Der Esch are here for one more year, and then it talked at least. And then um, Keon O'Neal was supposedly signed to convert to linebacker um, instead of safety. So they're, they look good on top, maybe, if you have faith in Quinn fixing what's gone wrong with Jalen and Van Der Esch. But depth is a real issue at linebacker. So I could see them drafting a lot of linebackers, um, depending on scheme fit and stuff. But the Cowboys tend not to do that. They usually diversify their picks through a lot of different positions that they you haven't seen. They, they, now, a lot of times you'll see they'll load up on one side of the ball. So I could see this being almost an all-defense draft. But I think it would be throughout multiple positions. So as you mentioned, down years for Van Der Esch, Jalen Smith, contract years coming up. Do you see them bouncing back next year? And how important are they to the team's success? Because like we mentioned, as much as the Cowboys look like they're building off of, okay, we're just going to score 35 a game and see if, if if you can match that. You still need your key players on defense mm-hmm. to contribute. And the, and the Cowboys do have a couple of key players on defense, just a couple down years last year. Yeah. So, I mean, this year is going to be big for the guys who are, who are making the money um, to be the top defenders to actually show up and be that. Um, that's now I, I I know he didn't get a lot of sacks, but Demarcus Lawrence is still a baller on defensive line, especially against the run. Um, he, yeah, his sack numbers have been down, but that is not the only gauge of a defensive end's value, despite what some people seem to think. Um, 
but yeah, the linebackers, you know, Jalen makes, um, I think now he's the second most expensive player on the defense after Lawrence. And, um, you know, Layton was a first round pick. If he wants another contract, you know, he, they, it doesn't look like they're going to pick up his fifth year option probably, um, just based on where things have been with his performance and his injury. But, um, they really, they really do have to step up. And the hope is that that one, you know, last year was a mess under Mike Nolan, who was just a bad hire. It, it just didn't make sense. He hasn't been good since he had Ray Lewis in Baltimore and who wouldn't look good coaching that defense. Um, so yeah, we'll see how that goes. But I, I would say this is a, it, either of them will be gone. If they don't have good years. Yeah. Sure. And my mistake, I forgot about the Smith contract. There is a potential out this this year, correct? Like for Jalen? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this was a year where Dallas could have cut Jalen and gotten some relief from the cap if they made him a June first cut. Okay. Year, next year they can get relief as an outright cut. Um, so yeah, it it's put up or shut up time for both of them. So definitely, also- Jalen really needs to shut up if he doesn't start playing better. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's funny. I I was going through going through some of your tweets uh, a couple of days ago, and uh, I saw this the one um, that was like highlight or like spend you know two hours. Oh, it, it was Darius Leonard. Darius yeah. Leonard tweeted, uh, you know, uh, I just spent two hours looking at at my bad plays, and you quote tweeted and said Jalen Smith would need two months. <laughs> but uh, no, like serious, like it was a really down year for him, filling gaps, missing tackles. Uh, mm-hmm. Just not not a good year for him for someone mm-hmm. who has worked so hard to come up from, from that knee injury suffer all the way back at Notre Dame in the Fiesta Bowl in the Fiesta Bowl against Ohio State and then came back but got drafted really late fell hard I mean he was a really good linebacker prospect and he fell a lot because of that injury and then Dallas took him and worked so hard and he had a great rookie year great second year and got the contract and hasn't really been the same since. No, he hasn't. Um, he's a great story. He seems like a really good guy, like with philanthropy work and, and things like that. I think he's someone that his teammates really like and listen to, but you got to leave by example first and foremost. And he was one of the guys who just seemed the most lost and out of place on the field last year. Um, and, I, you know, how much of that was Mike Nolan? We don't know. We'll find out this year. Yeah, and he's still he's still only 26. Yeah, the contract is bad, but he's coming off of, you know, PFF seasons of 80, 74, and then a one almost under 50 last year. So <laughs> it was a very, very rough season. But uh, let's kind of talk about the some of these other young players on the roster. C.D. Lamb was on pace for a record year last year before Dak goes down. Uh, Neville Gallimore, the, the the IDL out of Oklahoma rookie last year, gained the, the starting spot halfway through the season. Obviously, there's uh digs which which young player maybe someone I, I didn't name is a prime candidate to break out in 2021 um well i think that if what we saw last year was any indication donovan wilson at safety is is looking like you know he seems to already have a knack for making plays now if he can shore up the day-to-day coverage side of his game he's gonna be really really good um that's one of the exciting things about Dan Quinn coming is, I mean, who's done better work making safeties look good than right. Dan, than that Seattle defense that he, and even in the Atlanta, his Atlanta defenses weren't always great, but Keanu Neal is a pro bowler. Um, and the other guy we signed, DeMonte Casey, I mean, he had, was it seven interceptions in one season as a starter under Dan Quinn? So, Ricardo I mean, Allen too, just signed, just signed yeah. with, with Cincinnati. I mean, there's three of them that, Atlanta safeties that that got new contracts this uh, this offseason. So yeah, I mean, I'm excited for what Wilson can do. Um, I'm also I'm also excited. You mentioned Gallimore, but I think Tristan Hill, he was really starting to flash some things before he got hurt last year, and so that combination of Gallimore and Hill, if they progress on what we've seen, they could be a much better um, defensive tackle duo than we've had in a while. So kind of to, to wrap this up, and then I'm going to ask you about the Lakers because like your fan here too, but uh, okay. uh, pick, pick number 10, you're the GM, who are you taking? Oh, uh, well, if he's there, I'm taking Pitts. And then if he's not, um, I'm probably going to go cornerback just because I, I do think that 
you have Horn between Horn, Sertain, and Farley. You got three guys who are worthy right. with the tenth overall pick. So I would take them. I might trade down. I might see if I could get Farley a little yeah. later. I might trade down. Um, but yeah, and and then otherwise I would go offensive tackle. Just yeah, w- Smith's out the door probably in a few years. Right, right. And I was just about about to mention the the possibility of trading down to get one of the three corners that they're all arguably cornerback one. I mean, they're, all three of them are, are spectacular, but Jerry Jones kind of has a thing where he just picks one guy and just takes him and doesn't really care where he takes him. Um, like he, that's, that, that, that's just who he is. So maybe not trading down, but you're right. All three of them are definitely worth that number 10 overall pick. It wouldn't be a reach taking either of them. Some people might say taking JC Horn in the top 10 or, or fairly, fairly in the top 10 with those injury concerns might be a little rough. Certain kind of is the consensus number one, but I disagree. I think all three of them are, are worthy of top, you know, 10 picks. Yeah. Don't sleep either on the possibility that they might trade up for Pitts because they do have those extra picks this year. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, if Pitts were to get past Atlanta at four, I, I mean, I think anything could happen at that point. Yeah. I mean, and and, and I, I agree with you. I mean, I, like what you said, I think it's going to be hard for the Falcons to pass on him. I mean, they had Tony Gonzalez. They're a team that's going to really value the tight end position and a chance to get him is, is going to be hard for them to pass up for sure. But I mean, honestly, why wouldn't Atlanta consider a quarterback at this point? Right. I, that, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, Matt Ryan has a couple years left. They've, they've done all they can to, to keep him around multiple restructures back-to-back years that like that it, it just feels like they're just gonna keep building the team around him because you know when uh, I had the the Falcons episode with Mark Zeno a, a couple a couple days ago uh we, we were talking about how these NFC teams are, are left over like the NFC teams that made the Super Bowl all are pretty much in rebuild mode except for the Niners and the Rams who the last two teams to make out other than Tampa, you know, Panthers no longer with Cam Newton, the Eagles no longer with Carson Wentz. There's, there's more I'm forgetting. Um, but the Falcons are this one leftover team that's still, they, they're not committing to the rebuild yet. And they're hanging around a Matt Ryan with, with that contract. And the Rams got, or even the Rams don't have Jared Goff anymore, even though they're still a, a very good team, but these teams and the Niners look like they're moving off of Jimmy G. So there's, but the, the Falcons looking strong with, with Matt Ryan and now even the possibility of giving more weapons to him instead of replacing him. Yeah. I, I, I just think, I think that it's very easy to, to put pits to them, but I think they could be very being quiet. I mean, if the Packers drafted a guy to go underneath Aaron Rodgers on the depth chart last year, anything could happen at that fourth pick. I mean, and someone, I mean, for someone for Matt Ryan to groom to take over in the next year sure. or two, I mean, that's, it's totally on the table. Yeah. All right. Real quick, before we let you go, uh, some Lakers, it is, uh, I mean, they won last night, but uh, not a, a fun time right now. Davis and LeBron on the shelf. And when Davis went down, it could have been a lot worse. It could have been the Achilles. It could have been a torn Achilles, and that would have just ended everything. But then LeBron goes down. And so first, when when Davis goes down, we're all kind of like, okay, is, is LeBron going to turn on the Jets, or is he going to slow down, you know, give up the MVP, rest of the playoffs, and, you know, play play most games, but, but kind of just take it, you know, 85 90%. He kind of goes the latter route, doesn't really have some great games, and then gets injured. Like, well, are you worried? Because I'm – I'm not really that I'm not really worried because I know this team with those two players is the best team in basketball. Like I mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm worried because I know LeBron's gonna come back fine. And yeah. Davis did the same thing last year. The regular season is a joke in the NBA. <laughs> I mean, it really is. I the season doesn't start till April in the NBA. It does. I mean, let, let's be honest. I mean, yeah, you got the bubble teams who are trying to make the playoffs. The Lakers are gonna make the playoffs. And then from there, it's a whole new season for them. Uh, I I don't I don't see anything that happens um, at this point. Honestly, I, I probably need to change my Twitter profile. I, I've about quit paying attention to them over the, the last few years. I, I I used to be a huge. I mean, I've been a Lakers fan going back to like the days of like Eldon Campbell and Eddie Jones and <laughs> and those guys. But you know, like since LeBron's come in, I'm I'm just it's just mercenary ball at this point. The whole NBA is just 
all these guys trying to get on the same team. And I, I miss the days. Like I grew up with the NBA when you had like Charles Barkley trying to win a championship in Phoenix on, by, on his own with, and you had Kemp and Peyton in Seattle and Malone and Stockton in Utah. And I mean, these guys took pride in like being in one place and trying to win there. I miss, I miss that a lot. I, I don't know. And I've, I've kind of fallen out of love with the NBA more and more. I, I, I will say this, though. I, th- I think this year's a, a, a different than, you know, the Warriors teams, the Heat team, because now it's just a bunch of duos. Like, yeah, the, the, the Nets got James Harden, but, you know, the Suns have their duo. Um, mm. there's the, the, the Mavericks have their duo. Bucks have their duo. Uh, Celtics have, you know, their duo, Tatum and Brown. Like, it's a, it's a bunch of duos. I wouldn't say there's any super, super teams like there were a few years ago, but yeah, mm-hmm. you know, it, there, there, there's really not much parity, but I, I will say this year, especially with, with, with the, the Lakers situation, I don't think there's ever been a, a season where there's more teams that can win the finals than, there, than, than, than this year. It is very wide open. If I root for anyone now, I, I, I kind of root for uh, Dame Lillard in Portland. <laughs> I like that guy, and I, I would love to see him take the West one year because he, he really he's, – he's as good as they come in the league. And I don't think he gets enough respect because he's out in Portland. Right. And whoever goes to Portland just never never really gets out. But he, he's had a, a couple of good teams, made a Western mm-hmm. Conference Finals a few years ago, got swept by Golden State. But uh, other than that, hasn't really been close. But, Jess, man, thank you for, for coming on. Yeah. Make sure to follow him on Twitter at Cowboys Addicts. Jack, uh, Jess, thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, enjoyed it, Jake. Thanks for having me. No problem. And thank you, everybody, for listening or watching this episode of 32 Teams in 32 Days. We'll catch you in the next one.